Springfield College. It's great to see such a turnout here uh, for a very exciting lecture called Why Diets Fail by Dr. Nicole Avina. My name is Rich Wood, and I'm the director of the Center for Wellness Education and Research here at Springfield College. We know that right now, nutrition is probably more important than it's ever been. We know it can help improve quality of life. We know that it can help reduce risk of chronic disease. But we've also learned that our high school students learn very, very little about nutrition. Now, we've also learned that high school athletics is increasing in popularity. There are currently 7.8 million high school student athletes in this country, which is a record number. We also know that less than 2% of those will go on to play college sports. So congratulations, college athletes. Uh, but what I really want to mention about that is, since so few of these high school athletes go on to college sports, we have an opportunity to teach these individuals about nutrition. So what we've done at the Center for Wellness Education and Research is we've created an educational program for high school student athletes called Wellness Through Sports. The Wellness Through Sports program is a 15-part video series. Each video is six to eight minutes long, and it talks about things like fast food, candy, screen time, recovery from exercise, soda, energy drinks. The student athletes watch these videos over the course of their season, and then after their season, we, we do some surveying to find out what, what they learned from doing this. And so what we think is that sports is actually the hook for these kids to get them to care about nutrition, and we can get that to them before they graduate from high school. And I wanted to take an opportunity just to show you a very short excerpt of one of these videos that's related to soda content. Yeah, very fitting for time. Hi, my name is Gabriela Gadra. I am an All-American athlete and member of the cross country and track and field teams here at Springfield College. I am here to talk with you about soda consumption. Although it's a tasty drink that is usually readily available, soda consumption can negatively impact your abilities as an athlete and may create habits According that affect to your research, health later. 12 to 19 year old boys who drink soda consume an average of 81 gallons of it per year. Girls the same age drink an average of 61 gallons. Let's put this in perspective. This is a 12 ounce can of soda. Over here I have sugar packets and a cylinder. Each of these sugar packets contains one gram of sugar. Right now I'm tearing open as many sugar packets as I need for you to see how much sugar is in a 12 ounce can. Now would you ever sit and eat the contents of this cylinder? Well. Anytime you consume a 12 ounce can of soda, that is exactly what you are doing. All of this sugar can negatively impact your performance. At any given time, a healthy person should have about one teaspoon of sugar in their entire blood volume. If you consume a 20 ounce serving of soda, you increase your blood sugar content by 15 to 20 times. Well, that concludes our segment. Thank you for joining us. And next time you go to grab a can of soda, ask yourself, is it worth it? So that's an example of just a portion of the soda video. It's six to eight minutes long. There are interactive segments on that for the students. And there is also a quiz at the end. If this is something you think you'd like to see in a high school that you're affiliated with or that you know, we can get that in there. We can give them this educational program, and we're doing this free of charge right now. You can contact me, my email address is up here, and I invite you to take a look at our website, which is springfield.edu backslash CWER. You can see the whole video. You can also learn a little bit about the testimonials from some of the student athletes we're working with currently. So, now I'd like to give you the opportunity to get up and if you have any extra Halloween candy on you right now, <laughs> you might want to just either put it deep in your pockets, Hide it in the back, whatever you got to do. This is the chance. Uh, we just recently welcomed Dr. Nicole Levine to campus uh, a couple of hours ago. She spent some time with our undergraduate and graduate students. And in my brief discussions, they were absolutely fascinated. They were just so impressed with her knowledge and her, her uh, uh, personality with just 
being so welcoming. So, uh, Nicole, thank you so much for doing that. And we just had a terrific dinner with Nicole, and I think that we're all in for a really, really special lecture. So I'd like to introduce Nicole now uh, as she tells us uh, about her, her uh, presentation that's called Why Diets Fail. So, Nicole Avina, Dr. Nicole Avina is a research neuroscientist, an author, and an expert in the fields of nutrition, diet, and addiction. She's a, she is a pioneer in the field of food addiction. Her seminal research work having jump-started this exciting new field of exploration in medicine and nutrition. She received her PhD in neuroscience and psychology from Princeton University, followed by a postdoctoral fellowship in molecular biology at the Rockefeller University in New York City, which is an all-research institute that lays claim to having had 24 Nobel Prize winners on its staff. Dr. Avina presently is the Assistant Professor of Pharmacology and Systems Therapeutics at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City. Dr. Avina has published over 70 scholarly journal articles, as well as several book chapters and books on topics related to food, addiction, obesity, and eating disorders. She's edited the books Animal Models of Eating Disorders and Hedonic Eating, and co-authored the popular book on food and addiction called Why Diets Fail. That book is for sale in the lobby, and Dr. Bean is kind enough to stick around after and sign anybody's copy. And uh, more recently, she's also published What to Eat When You're Pregnant. Her research achievements have been honored by awards from several groups, including the New York Academy of Sciences, the American Psychological Association, the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Her research has been funded by the National Institutes of Health and National Eating Disorders Association. Dr. Avina is a sought-after speaker and has been lauded by her colleagues and the public for her ability to explain complex scientific principles and research findings to a lay audience. She regularly makes speaking appearances and discusses her research and discoveries throughout the United States, Europe, and Asia. She appeared on the Dr. Oz Show, Good Day New York, the Couch, Home and Family, The Better Show, as well as many local news programs. Her work's been featured in Bloomberg Business Week, The New York Times, Shape, Men's Health, Detail, and many other periodicals. Dr. Rabina has been identified as an expert in diet research by Psychology Today and has a blog featured on their website entitled Food Junkie which explains relevant research findings in an accessible way. You can follow her on Twitter and find her on Facebook. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Nicole Avina. But what I think we don't often always mention, and sometimes forget, is that 
There's other factors associated with obesity besides it being just a medical problem. So people who are overweight or obese often will have psychological and economic and social struggles as well. So it costs a lot to pay for health care for these individuals. They also report greater incidences of depression and overall feeling not such a great sense of well-being that can sometimes be associated with their increased body weight. And there's also stigma associated with being overweight. So I think it's important that we approach this as a whole person problem, not necessarily just as a medical problem that we're trying to fix. So the question that's perplexed me for many years now is, well, why is it, despite the fact that we have all these diet programs out there, all these ways in which you should be eating, why can't people just follow them? Why can't people stick to a healthy eating plan? Why are so many people overweight and obese? Well, there's a few different reasons. One comes down to portion size, or what people often refer to as portion creep. So over the years, you see that if you look at the 1950s, this was the typical size of you know, an average fast food hamburger or fries and shake. But if you fast forward to modern times, which I think this was from the CDC in 2010, you can see that the sizes of these items have gone up dramatically. And as a result, the size of the stick figures has presumably gone up dramatically as well. So certainly the increases in portion sizes that we're consuming is leading to increased calorie intake. It's also the case that food acquisition is easier than it used to be. So this is a cartoon that would depict what our ancestors probably looked like. We were hunters and gatherers. You had to go out and find food and kill it and look for berries. And it was a lot of work. It wasn't easy. But things have changed. And unfortunately and fortunately, this is more like what food foraging looks like today. People go hunting for food in these big box supermarkets where you can buy massive amounts of foods that are able to be stored in our refrigerators or preserved. And so it's much easier to acquire and store food than it used to be. And we really don't have to work physically quite as hard to get it as we used to in the past. So one element that I think is important to this issue that we don't often hear about is talking about the different types of hunger. And so we typically think about being hungry as being associated with needing calories because you have a calorie deficit. But that's actually only one type of hunger. So these children over here are hungry in the sense that they're starving. They don't have food. They need food. They have the discomfort, and they require calories to alleviate it. These kids are also hungry, but they're hungry in a different way. There's a such thing as hedonically driven hunger. So this is an example of if you've not necessarily hunger for calorie eating, but hunger because of the pleasure associated with the food or the reinforcement you get from eating that food. And so these children are eating because they want to consider or experience the pleasant sensations associated with that food. So these are two very different types of hunger. And I think that this hedonic driven eating is part of the reason why we're seeing problems with obesity, because I think a lot of the eating that occurs in our modern times has to do more with hedonic aspects of the food, the pleasure of the food. And that's what the, to the topic will be of discussion today. <laughs> So it turns out that people don't always eat because they're actually hungry in the sense that they eat calories. People sometimes eat just because they want to eat. People eat because the food tastes good. People eat because they're bored or they're stressed or they're lonely. So there's many different reasons why people consume food. And it turns out that if you look at the types of foods that people eat for these hedonically driven purposes, they tend to be foods that are rich in fats and added sugars and also calories. And they're very easy to overeat. And so because these foods are, for most people, pretty ubiquitous in our society, you can get these foods at convenience stores and fast food type restaurants, they've become a big part of our social lives. And so we're seeing very easy access to these hedonically driven food products in our society. So one aspect of this that we've decided to focus on is looking at sugar. And this isn't meant to pick on sugar by any means, but one of the reasons why we chose sugar was because Part of the reason is that when we look at the statistics, we find that the average American is consuming 22 teaspoons of added sugar each day. And that's an awful lot of added sugar, especially when we're looking at more recent guidelines, which are suggesting people consume something more like, you know, depending on your weight and your size, between six and eight teaspoons a day. So overall, regardless of body weight, Americans are consuming way too much added sugar. So, I want to underscore that when we talk about food reward, the hedonic properties of food, as it relates to obesity, we have to remember obesity is an endpoint, and it has multiple contributing factors. We won't find the cure for obesity because there isn't going to be a cure. There's going to be many cures because there isn't one cause of obesity. Obesity is caused by lots of different things. It's caused by a sedentary lifestyle, genetic vulnerability, 
the ease of food accessibility, the changes we have with regard to social norms about food. Obviously, there's stress and endocrine factors that contribute to eating that we don't have time to talk about this evening. We mentioned about increased portion sizes. But what my life is interested in is this concept of food reward. What is it about the foods that we're eating and these modern design foods that maybe could be contributing to the obesity epidemic? Okay. So I know I'm sort of leading you with my discussion, but before I go on, who in the audience thinks that foods could be addictive, just based on your own experience or what you've heard? Okay. So most people do. And it turns out that we have data that kind of back this up. There was a study conducted by Credit Suisse that asked medical professionals, so these are people who are physician assistants, therapists, primary care physicians, people in the trenches working with patients, seeing patients on a daily basis, do you believe that sugar is addictive? And you can see that by and large, the majority said probably yes or definitely yes. And this is something that was found not only in the United States, but also in several other countries. So it does seem that people working with individuals feel that yes, sugar is addictive. I also think that the food companies think sugar is addictive or food is addictive. And we see this because if you look at their advertising campaigns, you see lots of addiction-laden terms. And so they're talking about craving. Craving is something we often think about when we're talking about drug addiction. But when we look at all these different ad campaigns, you see the term addiction, you see craving, you see these other types of terminology that would traditionally be associated with substance abuse. So before we start talking about the addiction side of this, I think it's important to talk about the food side of this. So right now, the way our government is structured, a food is anything that has a nutrition label. And I think that needs to change, and I don't agree with it at all, and I'll show you why. So here's an example of a food. Anyone have a guess what this food is? I'll give you a clue. Whole baby carrots, okay? So it's pretty easy to figure this one out. If you look at, you know, this is all the information about whole baby carrots, but if you simply look at the ingredients, it's pretty clear that this is a bag of whole baby carrots, and it's a food. Now here's another food under the same rules and regulations as whole baby carrots. Anyone have a guess as to what this one is? Here are the ingredients. Not so easy, huh? So the point here is that we have a big umbrella of what we consider to be a food. And so things from whole baby carrots to things that are pop marks mini crisps that contain lots of different chemicals and additives and things that cause them to be considered what we would be talking about as being a highly processed food. So what's the big deal about processing? So some foods have more ingredients and chemicals in them than others. Why does that matter? Well, I think it really can be an important factor that we need to think about. So here's a picture of a coca leaf. This is the primary ingredient in cocaine. Now, where coca leaves grow in our indigenous parts of the world, people chew on the leaves. They have very low abuse liability. I've never heard of anyone be addicted to coca leaves. However, I know several people who, if you take that coca leaf and refine it and extract it, add a bunch of chemicals to it, you can create cocaine and crack cocaine, and that's a very highly addictive substance. Same with grapes. I've never met anyone addicted to grapes. But if you take a grape and refine it and process it and add some things to it, you can very easily make it into something that's highly addictive. Same with poppy seeds. Poppy seeds are something that many people eat on a daily basis on their bagel. I don't ever think I've heard anyone become addicted to the poppy seeds. But again, if you take them and refine them and extract things from them and process them, you can easily turn them into something that can be considered highly addictive, such as an opiate. So I'm wondering now if the same thing might be said of food. We can have corn-based products. I don't have a problem with corn. I think it could be, I'm a Jersey girl, so I have to like corn. But if we take corn and we process it and refine it in the way that we've done with these other substances, we can easily go into something that's a very, very different product. Same with wheat. And then even the same with water and sugar cane alone. I don't think that these are problematic items. In fact, it can be very good for you. But when you put them together, put them in a way that it is processed, and it changes them in a dramatic way. So this leads into the discussion about the brain. And so I'm a neuroscientist, and so my interest is in you know, how do our behaviors affect our brain and vice versa. And so one of the things that really stands out with respect to food reward is that we know from the literature that drugs of abuse act on brain systems that were put in place to reinforce natural behaviors. So we have systems in our brain that make us want to do stuff, right? 
doesn't make us want to do drugs or want to have sex. It just makes us want to do the thing that feels good. There's not one system for one drug and one system for something else. It's a reward system, if you will. And so it turns out that the things we need to do to survive as a species are meat and eat. And that's why they feel good to do those things. Well, what happens when someone becomes addicted to a drug of abuse is that drug co-ops that brain system and takes over and hijacks it in many ways, if you will. So the point here is that the primitive brain systems that were put in place to reinforce natural behaviors get taken over by drugs of abuse. So we're talking about similar brain systems that are being activated by drugs and foods and other motivated behaviors. So it seems to me that some of these designer foods that are out there now that are highly processed combinations of different things that we just looked at in many ways resemble drugs in the sense that they are activating perhaps in a way that's exaggerated some of these brain reward systems. And that's what we've been investigating. So what is an addiction? That's another part of this question. So we can very carefully and scientifically define an addiction. So there's a book called the DSM. This is a Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It's a book that psychologists and psychiatrists use to diagnose all the different types of mental illnesses that are out there. And there's criteria in there to diagnose someone as having a substance dependence disorder or a drug addiction. And so what we can do is look at those criteria for drug addiction and simply ask ourselves, well, do we see these with food? And that's what we've been testing in our lab and what other labs have been looking at too. So I'm not going to take the time to go through all these, but you can see that in order to meet the criteria for having a drug addiction, you need to show signs of impaired control, such as binging, a desire or limit to quit, but not being able to. Spending a lot of time thinking about getting the substance or using the substance or recovering from use, craving. You also need to meet social impairment criteria. So is using the substance causing you to fulfill or fail to fulfill some major role obligation that could be detrimental to your life or school or work? Are you using it despite the fact that it's causing interpersonal problems? And are activities being given up because of its use? Also, there's risky use criteria. So is someone continuing to use a substance despite the fact that it's physically hazardous, despite the fact that they know it's harming them? And are people using the substance because of the pharmacological characteristics? So we see evidence of tolerance where you need to consume more and more and more of that particular substance to feel that same euphoria. Or do we see signs of withdrawal where if you don't have access to the substance, you feel lethargic and awful and just very irritable. Now you don't need to meet all of these criteria to be diagnosed as having a substance dependence, but these are examples of the criteria that doctors are looking for when they diagnose someone as having a drug addiction. So I'm sure if you think about you know, our typical quintessential drug addict, it's easy to envision why these are the criteria. But now think for a minute about someone who might be overweight or struggling with their body weight and trying to go on a diet and trying to lose weight and maintain a healthy weight. And if you think about these criteria in that context, I think you can start to see how these might fit in as well. But what we've done in our lab is to systematically test whether or not we can see evidence of these criteria being met when the substance of abuse is a highly palatable food. So we do two things in my lab. We're a translational research lab, so we use animal models because we're neuroscientists and we like to measure neurochemicals, and that's not always easy to do with humans because they don't like to volunteer for those studies. So we use laboratory graphs for those studies, but we also do clinical studies where we can ask people questions about some of the things that we're studying in the lab rats. So what we've done in our animal model work is to look for some of these DSM criteria. So we're looking for binging, withdrawal, and craving. We're also looking for signs of cross-sensitization. So if an animal is dependent on one drug, will they show a heightened responsivity to a different drug? You may have heard of this as a gateway effect, where if you become addicted to you know, smoking cigarettes, you're more likely to try harder drugs. And so we can measure that in our lab rats by looking at their, lo lo excuse me, their locomotor activity and also their intake of the particular substance. So I've been studying this for a while. Actually, I started doing this research back in graduate school. And back then, we had the DSM, the earlier version of the DSM, which was uh, the DSM-4. And these are some of the criteria that we had discovered using a model in which we developed where rats were simply given sugar to consume. And they would overconsume it. And they would show some of the DSM criteria, such as tolerance, signs of withdrawal, consuming more than intended. And they also showed a whole bunch of changes in the brain that I don't have time to talk about tonight, but I'm happy to talk about afterwards with people, such as changes in the release of chemicals like dopamine, which is associated with reward and reinforcement, and also changes in the receptor binding and gene expression of some of these neurochemicals as well. 
And these changes are similar to what you would see if an animal was addicted to a drug. But in our case, the animals were simply just overeating sugar. So I'm going to take you through some of these data today just to give you a sense about what it looks like. And so in our model, we just let the rat drink sugar. They have a 10% sugar solution. It's equivalent to the concentration of sugar you get in a can of soda. They also have water to drink, and they also have rat food, which is a healthy rat chow. And what we find is that if you give rats access to the sugar, some rats, they maintain a limited access schedule where they only have 12 hours a day to consume it, end up binging on it, and they develop signs of tolerance, where they drink more and more and more of it each day. This is compared to rats that have an ad libitum or all the time. Those animals seem to get used to it around and they you know, sort of responsibly consume it, if you will. When we look at the first hour of intake of these animals, we see that it's the rats that have that limited daily access that seem to really show signs of binging. If you look at how much they consume on that first hour of access, it's much larger by day 21 than it was on day one. And we don't see that happening in control groups that just occasionally get sugar, or even rats that have it available all the time. Something about having that restricted access to the sugar that seems to promote them to binge on it. And even when we restrict the rat's food intake, so we have a control group in which rats have just 12 hours a day to eat their chow, and they don't binge on it. They seem to eat the same amount on day one as day 21. So it's something about limited daily access to sugar that seems to cause this excessive overeating, and that's what we've been interested in studying. So I mentioned earlier that we have similar brain pathways that are activated by drugs and by food. But we know that drugs and foods aren't identical. Typically, when you become addicted to a drug, or if you take a drug, it releases a chemical in the brain called dopamine every single time it's administered. So every time someone smokes a cigarette, uses morphine, does heroin, any drug releases dopamine. It's a hallmark of drug use. That's why drugs are so addictive. They release dopamine in these reward areas of the brain. Food normally only releases dopamine when it's a new food. So when you're paying attention because maybe you've never had that particular type of cuisine, your brain releases dopamine associated with novelty. But over time, that dopamine release attenuates and wears out. So dopamine is not typically released in response to eating. And so the question we had is, well, what about a highly palatable food? We gave our rats sugar and asked the question, are they going to release dopamine in a way that's more like a drug or more like what we'd expect to see with food? And what we found was that by day 21 of access, the rats that had that limited daily access that were binging on the sugar are releasing dopamine in the brain in a way that looks like what you see with the drug. The control groups are releasing it in that attenuated manner, which is more like what you'd expect to see with a regular food. So there's something about binging on the sugar or overconsuming sugar that causes the release in the brain of dopamine to be very much like what you see with a drug of abuse. We also look for signs of withdrawal. So this is something that we can easily measure in our rats. We can look for signs of anxiety. This is something called the elevated plus needs. It's actually the gold standard for measuring anxiety in a rat. Every anxiolytic drug that's on the market now has gone through several iterations of having rats get that drug and go on this maze. If the rat's anxious, they'll stay in the dark parts. But if they're just happy, normal rats, they'll kind of explore everywhere. And what we find is that when we have animals that are overeating sugar and we take it away from them, or we give them a drug that would precipitate opiate withdrawal if they were addicted to opiates, we can see signs of withdrawal. We see anxiety on this maze. We see signs of depression. We see changes in their somatic indications, changes in their body temperature that suggest that they're in a negative state. My first instinct was to give the rats this stuff, right? Because this is what we have a problem controlling our intake of. But we want to be systematic in our methods. And so that's why we decided to focus on looking at sugar first. But we've done some other studies, and we know that food variety is very important. I think that's part of the problem, too, that we haven't addressed. You can change the food that you eat every single day. You can get a different cuisine every single day. There's so many different options out there for food. And we know that the more variety you have, the more likely you are to overeat. There's something called sensory-specific satiety. Well, if you get sick of eating Chinese food, guess what? You can go have Italian. When you get sick of that, guess what? You can go have dessert. So there's always another option to move on to. So we looked at this in our rats. We've done studies where we give rats all these delicious foods. And so we'll let them have access to peanut butter, bananas, marshmallows, chocolate chips. It's really like a rat buffet, if you will. And they get all these delicious foods. And we also give them access to healthy foods, like um, bananas. And we also give them a regular rat chow. And what we find is, of course, the rats become overweight. It's meant to model what happens with humans called the cafeteria diet. 
And so what we found in this particular study was that when we had rats on a cafeteria diet and we gave them amphetamine, you can see here that the rats that are overweight on a cafeteria diet will really lose more dopamine when they're given amphetamine. So they're having a heightened response to that dopaminergic agonist. We looked at 35 different foods that varied in different properties. And what we found was that, oh, excuse me, the foods that were rated as most highly addictive were pizza, chocolate, chips, cookies, and ice cream. I know, this is no surprise. Um, but this is, again, the statistical data that we need to sort of support what we already know. <laughs> and so the least addictive foods, again, no surprise here, cucumbers, beans, apples, and brown rice. So this is, I think, moving us in the right direction because it's helping us to pinpoint and identify what is it about the foods that are addictive and which foods should we be targeting in terms of interventions and our, our thinking about nutrition guidelines. Now, when we did some more further analyses on this, we were able to identify the factors associated with the foods that were identified as being particularly problematic with respect to addiction. And so the statistical analysis revealed that the level of processing was mo the most positive predictor of whether or not a food was considered addictive. So the more processed a food was, the more likely it was to be considered an addictive food. Also, interestingly, same with added fat content and glycemic load. And so these are two other factors that stood out as being associated with whether or not a food was considered as addictive. So I think that one thing we need to be mindful of, and this I bring up because I want to remind everyone what we should be thinking about. There's controversy about food addiction because people think about drug addiction as being something in which people have a loss of control that we really shouldn't even be talking about in the same context of food. People will think of the typical drug addict as being these individuals up here, people who maybe you know, are struggling, problems with the law, no jobs, really, really struggling. But guess what? That's not the typical drug addict. This is a typical drug addict. It's a mom who smokes, who's driving her kids to soccer practice. So we need to keep in mind that despite the fact that we tend to think about drug addiction as something associated with these individuals, the most vast majority of people who um, have a drug addiction are addicted to smoking. The most common addict in our society is likely a fully functioning individual, little noticeable intoxication, the withdrawal syndrome is mild, if at all. And because of that though, and despite the fact that smoking has health-related complications, it's the number one cause of preventable death in the United States. And so I think that if we're gonna talk about addiction to food, it's gonna be in a category of nicotine and smoking, not necessarily within a category that we think of when we're thinking about heroin, for instance. So just to summarize, I wanna sort of point out that there's been lots of scientific studies that have been conducted around this question. It's been a boom in the past, I'd say, 10 years, starting off with animal studies that I told you about and now leading into clinical experiments across multiple different labs. And if you look at those DSM criteria for addiction, you can see the criteria here, and you can see this was a review conducted by a colleague of mine back in 2012, that most of them had been met by animal models and human studies at that point. So there does seem to be mounting evidence that supports the idea that certain foods can have properties of an addiction. So this is kind of where the why diet scale comes into play. And I decided to do this book a couple years ago because I think that it's important for the science out there to be put into the public in a way that they can understand it. And there's so much information out there about food addiction and the research behind it. I really thought it would be a great idea to kind of put it together for everyday people to read. Because let's face it, everyday people aren't picking up journal articles and don't even have access to them. So they need to be able to find this information. So the reason why I think diets fail is sort of two part. One, the term diet, it, it connotes that it's a temporary thing. You're going to go on a diet to lose a couple pounds, or you get to your goal weight, and then you're going to go off the diet. But I think we need to change our mindset about that, because if you think about a diet as a way of life, and the way that you eat, it's a permanent thing. It's not a temporary thing. I also think that people find it difficult to stick to diets, because when they go on a diet, they will be fine for the first couple days, maybe the first week. But then something happens. I've had people tell me, oh, my blood sugar was dropping, I was so lethargic, and I just wasn't eating enough, and that's why I was very irritable and cranky. Well, it's not your blood sugar dropping, it could very well be withdrawal. These are the symptoms of withdrawal that can emerge. So feeling lethargic, feeling anxious and irritable. If you're eating a diet that's rich in processed foods and added sugar, then you abruptly stop it, 
you're going to feel bad. It's not going to be pleasant for a couple of days, just like it's not pleasant when you quit other substances activating your reward system in the way that it has been. So I think that's why a lot of people fail on many diets is because they misassociate their withdrawal with the fact that the diet just isn't for them or just doesn't work. Also, there's a lot of hidden sugars out there. Hidden sugars mean hidden calories. And so if you look at all the different food products that are out there, condiments, um, all these different granola bars and health items that are sort of marketed as being all natural and organic. Well, if you look at the labels, you'll see that usually the first couple of ingredients is sugar. And it's important, I think, for people to realize that there's so many different names for sugar. And so it's not just about looking and seeing how many grams of sugar are in a product. It's about understanding on the ingredients list, well, what is the names that they're using for the types of sugars that are included in this item? Because it's often the case for processed foods that there's multiple forms of sugar in there. It's not just sucrose. There could be other things in there as well that are also sugar. So it's important to recognize those different names. I also think that it's important to think about this from a psychological perspective. And so telling people that they should just stop eating sugar and quit it, like we would tell someone to quit drinking alcohol if they were an alcoholic, it might not fly in our modern society. This is because we live in a place where we have such an emphasis on food and there's so many cues and so many things associated with food. And I also think this is why a lot of diets do fail is because people try to do too much too fast. So in the book, I really try to sort of combine my training in psychology with what we've been doing in terms of our research to look at this from a psychological learning standpoint, about what will work in terms of learning and trying to help people wean themselves off of sugar in an environment that's promoting sugar and pushing it back in our faces, and it's not an easy thing to do. But here are some things that I think people can do. One thing, as I mentioned, is to read the labels and understand them. And so knowing what is in the products that you're consuming, understanding that lots of these different products that are marketed as being healthy aren't always healthy just because it says it's all natural and good for you doesn't mean that that's true. And knowing the different names for sugar. There's, I think, 56 different names for products that are actually sugars. And so understanding those and knowing how to recognize them, I think, is really important. Also, I advocate ditching the sugar-sweetened beverages or the SSBs. These have no nutritional value other than calories, and you're better off getting your calories from other sources. I also think that cold turkey isn't going to work. Again, you know, people try to give up too much too soon, and I think that's why we're often setting ourselves up for failure. So I advocate people trying to take sort of a modified cold turkey approach where you identify the most problematic part of your diet and then try to find something to replace it with. And so if you happen to be an avid soda drinker and sugar-sweetened beverages are really tough for you to give up, Identify what it is about those sugar-sweetened beverages that you like. Is it the fizziness? Well, then maybe you can replace them with water, fizzy water. Or if it's the caffeine, maybe you can replace them with some you know, black coffee. Identify what it is you like about it, and then come up with a substitution. So you're not living without something. You're just simply replacing it with an alternative that's going to make it easier. And then slowly integrating this idea of thinking into the other ways in which you eat. I also think it's important to think about the the health benefits of mindful eating. And so really being aware of what we're eating and thinking about it. And by cutting out the major sources of sugar from your diet, weight loss can occur. We know this. If you, you, know, think, you can see if someone does go on a diet where they drastically reduce the amount of sugar, weight loss can occur. It's just a matter of being mindful about it, understanding why it's working so that it can be a sustainable uh, effect that we'll see happening over time. And then again, breaking the cycle. What we're learning from the research is that this is a cycle. Addiction is a cycle. It's a cycle of a spiral of distress. You binge eat, you go through withdrawal, you crave. That leads to more binging, craving, and withdrawal. And it's a vicious cycle that, that continues. And I think that this happens for many people on the same level with food. And so it really comes down to being able to break that cycle by making modifications and severely reducing the amount of sugars that we have in our diet. Um, this is my contact information and my website if anybody wants to follow up or stay in touch afterwards. And lots of our scientific papers are on the web. Um, I also want to end by showing you a video. So I, I really think education is important, especially for young people. And I'm glad that we are in a situation and a place that is valuing the education, especially among high school students. And nutrition education is really, I think, going to be the key in sort of changing this tide of obesity that we're facing in our country. So this is a video that I did with Ted Ed. They produce short lessons that are geared toward, you know, high school, young adult age children. 
And the idea here is to really take complex scientific information and condense it into a fun video. So I'd like to show you this. Also, it takes what I just took an hour to explain and puts it into five minutes, and it's animated. So let's take a look, if you don't mind. Picture warm, gooey cookies, crunchy candies, velvety cakes, waffle cones piled high with ice cream. Is your mouth watering? Are you craving dessert? Why? What happens in the brain that makes sugary foods so hard to resist? Sugar is a general term used to describe a class of molecules called carbohydrates, and it's found in a wide variety of food and drink. Just check the labels on sweet products you buy. Glucose, fructose, sucrose, maltose, lactose, dextrose, and starch are all forms of sugar. So are high fructose corn syrup, fruit juice, raw sugar, and honey. And sugar isn't just in candies and desserts. It's also added to tomato sauce, yogurt, dried fruit, flavored waters, or granola bars. Since sugar is everywhere, it's important to understand how it affects the brain. What happens when sugar hits your tongue? And does eating a little bit of sugar make you crave more? You take a bite of cereal. The sugars it contains activate the sweet taste receptors, part of the taste buds on the tongue. These receptors send a signal up to the brainstem, and from there it forks off into many areas of the forebrain, one of which is the cerebral cortex. Different sections of the cerebral cortex process different tastes, bitter, salty, umami, and in our case, sweet. From here, the signal activates the brain's reward system. This reward system is a series of electrical and chemical pathways across several different regions of the brain. It's a complicated network, but it helps answer a single subconscious question. Should I do that again? That warm, fuzzy feeling you get when you taste grandma's chocolate cake? That's your reward system saying, mmm, yes. And it's not just activated by food. Socializing, sexual behavior, and drugs are just a few examples of things and experiences that also activate the reward system. But overactivating this reward system kickstarts a series of unfortunate events, loss of control, craving, and increased tolerance to sugar. Let's get back to our bite of cereal. It travels down into your stomach and eventually into your gut. And guess what? There are sugar receptors here too. They're not taste buds, but they do send signals telling your brain that you're full or that your body should produce more insulin to deal with the extra sugar you're eating. The major currency of our reward system is dopamine, an important chemical or neurotransmitter. There are many dopamine receptors in the forebrain, but they're not evenly distributed. Certain areas contain dense clusters of receptors, and these dopamine hotspots are a part of our reward system. Drugs like alcohol, nicotine, or heroin send dopamine into overdrive, leading some people to constantly seek that high. In other words, to be addicted. Sugar also causes dopamine to be released, though not as violently as drugs. And sugar is rare among dopamine-inducing foods. Broccoli, for example, has no effect, which probably explains why it's so hard to get kids to eat their veggies. Speaking of healthy foods, let's say you're hungry and decide to eat a balanced meal. You do, and dopamine levels spike in the reward system hotspots. But if you eat that same dish many days in a row, dopamine levels will spike less and less, eventually leveling out. That's because when it comes to food, the brain evolved to pay special attention to new or different tastes. Why? Two reasons. First, to detect food that's gone bad. And second, because the more variety we have in our diet, the more likely we are to get all the nutrients we need. To keep that variety up, we need to be able to recognize a new food, and more importantly, we need to want to keep eating new foods. And that's why the dopamine levels off when a food becomes boring. Now back to that meal. What happens if in place of the healthy, balanced dish, you eat sugar-rich food instead? If you rarely eat sugar or don't eat much at a time, the effect is similar to that of the balanced meal. But if you eat too much, the dopamine response does not level out. In other words, eating lots of sugar will continue to feel rewarding. In this way, sugar behaves a little bit like a drug. It's one reason people seem to be hooked on sugary foods. So think back to all those different kinds of sugar. Each one is unique, but every time any sugar is consumed, it kickstarts a domino effect in the brain that sparks a rewarding feeling. Too much too often, and things can go into overdrive. So yes, overconsumption of sugar can have addictive effects on the brain. 
but a wedge of cake once in a while won't hurt you. So that's available on YouTube if anyone wants to show it to different groups. Um, I'm really proud of it because it's got over 3 million views, which I think is pretty good for a geeky science video that didn't come out too long ago. So I'm happy to take any questions anyone has, and thank you again for your attention.